And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. And this is a video of a uh, harvest that may not be coming across to you very well through the technology, but we'll, we'll do our best. All right, do we have any questions? Uh, oh, I've got, uh, how has COVID-19 affected lionfish harvesting? That's a really good question. Um, I would imagine that it has impacted it um, to a certain degree, um, you know, in, in terms of a, the seafood sector and the fishery as a whole, um, fisheries as a whole, we're hearing that uh, commercial fishermen are not able to get out as often um, because that demand is just not there, the fish houses aren't buying. Um, and we did have to suspend, from an agency standpoint, we did have to suspend some of our incentive programs uh, just in, in the name of safety and, you know, the concern for um, both our staff and, and other folks who may be participating. Um, so I would imagine that that harvest had probably declined. Um, anecdotally, I'm, I am seeing more folks get out on the water and uh, we're having people continue to uh, take part in both of our lionfish challenge that's going on currently, as well as the harvest program. So people are getting out there, but I would imagine that COVID did did take a toll on on people's efforts for a while there. All right. Do we have any other questions? Oh, oh there's one. Uh, for more experienced licensed divers that dive 130 to 200 feet, what are the populations at that depth compared to 20 to 130? Feet? Uh, 130 feet. Can you repeat the question for me? I'm sorry, I didn't quite yeah. hear you. Um, so they're asking uh, the difference between uh, diving from 20 to 130 feet in that like recreational and advanced recreational range, uh, the populations there versus the populations in 130 to 200 feet more technical diver depth. Right. Um, I, I think you are likely to see probably a, a greater density of lionfish at those depths just because there are not a lot of folks reaching, reaching those locations. Um, however, it also just kind of depends on, on where you are, where you're, where you're going. Um, I know of some deep water sites that uh, are pretty well taken care of in terms of folks going out there um, and, and keeping, keeping those deeper sites clean. Um, but then there are other sites that are either maybe private sites or sites that not a lot of folks know about that are in those deeper waters that um, I would venture to say may, may still be covered in lionfish. So it's, you know, you're only as good as your spots. So definitely got to gotta find some of those, those structures. Yeah, as a diver in the Tampa Bay area, I can say that they are definitely more common the deeper you go. Uh, the, the closer to shore, the more likely it's been picked over uh, in, a, in a good way in this case. <laughs> yes. And I think too, they like the, the consistency of the temperature, you know, as you get shallower, you have that, that sunlight that to a degree can affect the water temperature. And they like that consistency, even though they can tolerate colder temperatures um, or warmer temperatures, they, you know, like that, that kind of constant cool, cooler water. Uh, we've got a question. Could pheromones be used to attract lionfish to a trapping location? That's a really good question. Um, I am not sure if pheromones have been tested, but I know that there's been some research done on sound and sound is an attractant. Um, lionfish do vocalize. Um, so there's been some work on that to see if um, some, some degree of that vocalization could, vocalization could attract them. Um, from just, just from kind of what I've seen in the water myself, um, they, they don't really, they're not like lobster. Whereas if you put a lobster in a lobster trap, um, others will come. That's kind of what they do in the lobster fishery. Um, I, I don't believe that's the case, uh, but it, it, it's certainly a interesting thought and something that could be explored. All right, a uh, few questions from Ellen. Uh, do you have to be a specific age to be qualified to catch lionfish? Uh, I think I can answer that, no. Nope. Uh, so there are, 
you know, of course, if you'll need your scuba certification, most likely. Um, there are people who harvest lionfish free diving or snorkeling. Uh, but again, as we talked about, they're, they're not really in high densities in, in those depths. Um, so you can do it, but I would recommend getting your scuba certification. And of course, your age, cert certain scuba certification agencies have, you know, a minimum age. So that that's really only the limiting factor. But from a regulatory standpoint, doesn't matter. Just as long as you're using specific gear, there's no bag limits or size limits or anything. All right. Uh, yeah, so you covered, are there legal ways to catch them without diving? I'll say, I know at least uh, for the Tampa Bay area, that's not a, not a likely occurrence. Um, on the East Coast and in the Keys, that's certainly more likely that you'd see them in that 10 to 20 foot depth range where you, you could free dive, snorkel. Um, and then uh, I asked the first speaker about this, but since these are so much more widespread, would it be worth looking into genetically modifying a number of them so they can't breed? Uh, I guess that's similar to the mosquito technology that they're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we've heard that suggestion, and it's something that I, I think has been considered, but uh, one of the, the cautions there is this, this species is so well established and, and travels so quickly um, that we would have to likely introduce a very large number of these genetically modified lionfish into the environment in order for them to, to have that intended effect of kind of slowing reproduction which you know would exacerbate the problem for for a certain amount of time um so so that's something that i think is makes us hesitant um and it's unfortunately not like some nice freshwater systems where it's a closed system um lionfish that settle out in the panhandle may have been spawned in mexico so this is a, it's a very large interconnected system um that that proves complicated to deal with um, yeah, I, I think it would be right. It'd be interesting as well to think about the connection to the Pacific through ships. Uh, if you were trying to, you know, when we release a biocontrol for plants in the U.S., it could be more assumed that it's not going to leave the U.S. after we do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, what about using Gulf drilling platforms as a base for trapping. I'm, I'm sure they're a base for spearfish harvest at the moment, but. That's really interesting. Um, I actually had not heard heard somebody mention that before. Um, I, I could be, I mean, they people do use rigs um, to spearfish. It's very, very popular, uh, especially up in the panhandle. Um, and I would imagine, I've only been on a couple myself, that, and there are line fish there, it's structure, uh, but I, I don't know what kind of impact or regulations would be around um, those platforms if they're still uh, in operation. So that, that's an interesting idea, and a lot of the trap work that has been done um, has shown that if, if it's if the traps are closer to a structure or where the lionfish are inhabiting, whether it's a reef, a natural reef or a coral reef, um, there is a threshold, right? So those traps need to be placed close enough that the lionfish will want to emigrate, I guess you could say, um, to, to that location. It's an interesting idea. Um, we have another, uh, what about catching, sterilizing and releasing? Um, So we could, we could do that. Um, that that again, that would be a very large effort. Um, as I mentioned, we you know it, we've removed close to three quarters of a million lionfish, and there's still plenty more out there. Um, that would have to be a very large, expensive effort um, in order to do that. And at that point, um, from an agency standpoint, we really just you know if you've already got the fish out of the water, you've already taken out its reproductive ability. Um, so we would just con say continue harvesting um, the fish and give them to friends, eat them yourself. People make jewelry out of their fins. There's a lot of uses for them. Right. And I, I know like with trap neuter release, you still have all of, uh, with cats, for instance, you still have all the downsides of feral cats as far as bird populations. Um, so they're still going to be on the reef eating all of the juvenile fish if you let them back out. Um, 
one more question uh, we have. It's kind of off topic and it's a controversial one. Uh, would you consider Goliath grouper a nuisance species at this point in time? I know 60% of their diet is crabs and lobster. I think that's some FWC research. Uh, and they have decimated invertebrate populations as well as other edible target fish game species such as snapper and other grouper species. I would wager that if you looked at take numbers on the commercial and recreational side, that does not hold up, but I am not a researcher. Right, yes, and that is, that's definitely a hot topic. Um, you know, from, from an agency standpoint, we did bring this to our commission in 2017 and presented our commissioners with uh, the current body of research that we had, as well as the different, uh, we did a variety of workshops on Goliath Grouper, because um, there are two sides to the story. It's, you know, a very lucrative ecotourism uh, point, um, but spearfishers and many folks that I know, you know, do get harassed by Goliath as well. Um, the, the honest truth is that more information needs to be taken um, from Goliath to determine the health of their population, even though we are seeing that their populations are better than they have been, um, you know, when they were close to fish to extinction, uh, there's still a lot to be done. Um, and actually in this past commission meeting, our commissioners did discuss wanting to bring that item back up for the commission. So I believe that's something that we will be discussing in the next year or so. Uh, but at this time, there there were no regulatory changes made in terms of taking Goliath. All right, do we have any other questions for Kaylee? I think I got them all. Uh, now's a good time to repost it if I missed you. All right, I think with that, we can wrap up. We are a little bit ahead, but that's okay. Um, we can stay on a little bit longer if anybody comes up with some questions, but uh, thank you, Kaylee Spurgeon, for uh, talking to us about lionfish. Super interesting. I love spearfishing those myself. And uh, everybody have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the uh, Suncoast Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area workshop here and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. We'll put the slide back up with our website. If you want to get in contact, you can find us through there. And otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for joining us.